came out of the blue. And I really think this is a but, effort. But unlike the free rides for the seniors, this actually could produce more money for the state. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a market response to this. And we've seen this overseas, for instance, in London. To go into the city center, you have to pay more for your car if you want to go all the way into the city center. And there's always been talk about doing something similar to that to ease congestion in the loop or somewhere on there. All right, finally, another transportation story, and that is the federal government is uh, making a final decision as to whether they're going to route all these Canadian national trains through a lot of suburbs that don't have heavy rail congestion right now. Uh, what is going to happen? Well, right now, the federal government is telling the Canadian National that they have to belly up more money for overpasses and underpasses for the trains that are traveling through these towns and also are going to be stopped on tracks blocking traffic in these towns. Uh, traditionally, the railroads pay about 5% of the cost of these overpasses, and the uh, consultant to the Surface Transportation Board says CN should pitch in about 15%. Uh, still, uh, you know, these overpasses can cost $40 million each. There's dozens of them, if not hundreds of them, in the Chicago area. And CN has said, well, it'll pay a total of $40 million. So there's still a ways to go, uh, but we could have a decision on this as early as late this year. What and makes this such a difficult issue, Joel, is that we all know is that uh, it impacts negatively on some communities, but helps other communities right. in the Chicago area. Right. And that's what makes the decision so difficult. And, and it impacts them not only in terms of inconvenience, but property values. I mean, if, you're, if, if your uh, house is near a place that has three trains going by a day and suddenly has 26, which I think is the ratio in Barrington, for right. instance, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that, that can lower your, your values. Oh, exactly. And in, in other areas, like on the Burlington Northern Line, towns have planned for this, where they've built fire stations on both sides of the tracks. So if a train is standing or blocking the tracks, emergency vehicles could still respond. Mm -hmm. But in many of these towns where the EJ and E would go through, uh, they don't have that kind of setup. And it could be, at, at the minimum, a public uh, safety problem. Exactly. OK, well, we're going to move on to the political beat. President-elect Obama's uh, meeting with John McCain this week, and he's picking some new administration team members. And the city council rubber stamps Mayor Daley's bad news budget. Bob Crawford, uh, we hear a lot about change from Obama, but all these changes that I'm seeing are uh, old Clinton people. Well, it's not unusual to bring in veterans because you need people who know how the game is played in Washington. Someone like Rahm Emanuel, for example, who's had experience both in Congress and in the White House to be chief of staff. That's a solid choice. Tom Daschle, he was a Democratic uh, a leader in the Senate. Uh, he's a good man to choose for health care reform because he's worked on that for many years. He knows what Congress will and won't do. So. I don't necessarily equate the picking of veterans with the fact that there won't be change. I think it's possible for veterans to still take direction from the president and move in the direction of change and maybe get it done more effectively. But you know, change is an elusive term. It's an abstract term. Well, it means different and, things to different right, people. And, 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 and I've never felt that there would be all that much change anyway because Congress moves incrementally. It never wants to swallow anything whole. So I think whatever change there is is going to be gradual with the possible exception of the economy. I think some kind of dramatic stimulus package is well, something why, to look for. Why, and this, I throw this to Tom as well, why do you think he's uh, delayed so long in naming a Treasury Secretary? From the market's perspective, that's the big question here. Let's get to the cabinet position that is the most important for this next administration, which is who is going to hold the reins and the checkbook of the $700 billion financial rescue package that this Congress and the Treasury Secretary Hank Paulson was able to push through. Pick? I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of names that have been filled. He should, I think, it would be well advised to get a name out first and have that name be the name where the market is going to have and some confidence. And the fact that he hasn't done it yet, I think, suggests that Barack Obama typically is a cautious person. Mm -hmm. He's moving very carefully. He knows how important that job's going to be, and he has to get the right person that he's satisfied with. So I do not blame him for delaying the selection at all, well, the not market, in the current climate. But the stock market seems to blame him, is what you're the, saying. Yeah, the market well, is not having any patience whatsoever no. because it needs a shot of confidence. Hillary Clinton is Secretary of State. Ryan Baker, good choice. It would seem to be, but, but uh, you know, do you want the Bill Clinton factor that comes along with that? I mean, that seems to be the, the key negotiating factor that's going well, on. Well, as I understand yeah, it, yeah, yeah. The, she's got it if yeah. she can just uh, clear the slate here. Well, yeah. I don't think anybody's really sure because all sorts of people are talking, but you wonder how many people really are on the inside. Um, I think this kind of thing has been handled 
in, in a kind of messy way for a campaign that's so well organized and so disciplined, I have to say. They put this test balloon out there, and you know, whenever you put a test balloon out there, you don't want to leave it out there so everybody can keep shooting at it, either make a decision or don't make it. And there are a lot of other questions, too. What would Bill Clinton's role be if she's Secretary of State? Right. And whose foreign policy would it be? And what about, all the, or Barack and what about all the contributions that Clinton yeah. has gotten for his... I think she could be a better service in the Senate. I really do. And in terms of what Bob's saying about floating trial balloons and seeing what the reaction is, back to the Treasury choice, I think that's not the type of strategy that an Obama administration wants to have. It wants to put out that name and have confidence, and that's the guy or the gal that is going to be the head of the Treasury. Well, do you think he's gone to people and they've said no? I, I have no idea at this point, but certainly it's got to be one of the why, most why difficult jobs. Why is it such jobs. a difficult decision when, uh, it, from what you hear, it's the same people, too. The, the possibilities are former Treasury secretaries themselves. Which makes it that much more difficult, I think, of a, of a decision in because terms he, of... Because it has to show something that's changed. There's the track record, exactly right. And they have to be sure that there's going to be a beginning confidence in the ability of that person to do the job. We've already seen Paulson change the rescue plan for the banks. That caused havoc on Wall Street because Wall Street you know, got the impression they didn't know what they were doing. There that's are right. some and cynics. And I think Obama wants to avoid that. There are some cynics, and some of them are Republicans at this point, who say that uh, he's intentionally letting the economy unravel so that when he gets in there, it, it'll be that much easier to, to bring it back. Well, that's uh, and it's certainly and, a And there has been things written about that during uh, when Roosevelt took over from Hoover, for yeah, instance. Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's that's a huge bet, assuming that you can then turn it around as the bar would be set so low. Yeah. My feeling is that things are already bad enough where you don't have to let them get worse. How much worse can they get? Right. Market can I think Obama's zero. big concern <laughs> now is what do we do to get ourselves out of this mess, and will the public be patient enough how do you, how do, to give us about time? The, a polling during the, uh, the election that said Obama was better qualified to deal with the economy. I mean, what was that? really based on the, those answers. It was based on the fact that people wanted change and he was the agent of change. That's what it was all about. People didn't really know whether he was really better qualified or not, but what they did know was that they didn't want any more of President Bush or his policies. That election was always about a rejection and he, and of Bush and his steady policies. steady while McCain was right. suspending his it's campaign. It's all about change. John McCain came change. out at some point and said that the economy is not a strong suit. And it was a major blunder on his part. Yeah. All right, well, let's not re relive the campaign. Let's uh, relive the city budget, though, one last time. Uh, only one person objected to the budget, and it was Ocasio, Alderman Ocasio. What was his complaint, and is this a good budget, and is this the best possible solution for the city, well, Bob? He was, he was complaining for one thing that a lot of uh, middle managers were being given a pass and they were laying off lower level people and he was complaining about some things not, de not being delivered in his ward which is always a sensitive issue. Looking at the general picture, Joel, this is a this six billion dollar plan the mayor has is only precariously in balance. The mayor is not using property taxes. He's got some layoffs, but he's using resources like hiking parking taxes, hiking taxes on theater tickets and sports venue tickets, being more aggressive with the Denver boot. These are the kind of avenues to balancing the budget that are very shaky at best. And I would not be surprised if the economy doesn't improve if Mayor Daley has to come back at the end of the first or second quarter with a supplemental budget that has even more draconian cuts and maybe a property tax hike in it. Wow, that's kind of a dire prediction. Uh, it's very difficult to try to balance a budget based upon expectations of higher taxes on discretionary spending and in an economy and job layoffs. And been made, like the parking meters. That's right. And then they got a situation where they, had, did, 929, they had 929 layoffs in the budget, and that's where you save a lot of money because 80% of the budget is personnel. But then they cut this back now with some deal they've got with the unions where the unions are going to have some of their people take buyouts, but those buyouts trigger one-time mm -hmm. expenses, severance expenses. Expenses. Meanwhile, well, so you is, don't is save it that tempting much. for him to grab more of that Skyway money and the Midway money? And how, he does, might how does he have restrain to do that. himself? He might have to do that. There's a possibility they might have to because the alternative might be yet another property tax hike, and boy, that will not go down okay, well, well at all. Okay, well, the state is also having its uh, fair share of problems and then some. It sure is. And uh, the state Senate, though, uh, just elected uh, John Cullerton as the new Senate president succeeding Emil Jones. Uh, what is Blagojevich going to do about his giant deficit? Well, uh, what Blagojevich is talking about now is he wants the legislature to give him more authority to make more spending cuts, but I don't think the 
the legislature wants to give up that oversight authority. I think that'll be a tough sell. He also wants to engage in some short-term borrowing, and he also has sent a letter to the government asking for a $3 billion infrastructure investment program. I love that word investment. They call it investment instead yeah. of a bailout. But anyway, he wants $3 billion from the government but to if, help. But is it really a bailout if it does go for infrastructure? No, if it, go, if it goes for, for, for worthwhile projects, no, it is a solid investment providing the federal government can, can uh, uh, you, know, you know, provide the money. But the big problem here, Joel, is that they, they are $800 million below the revenue projections that they made for income taxes, corporate and individual income taxes and sales taxes. Uh, they're also losing money on the state's investments, just like we are losing money on our investments. Casino revenues are down. They're looking at a $2 billion hole by next June, the end of the fiscal right. year. And is, is this Bogoyevich's so, fault? Or is it the no, I, I think a lot of it is the fault of the economy, but I think maybe if, uh, a lot of the fault can be placed on everyone in Springfield for a lack of leadership right at a moment when we need it. Okay, well, there, I, I'm not going to predict that you're going to get it, even though this is the moment. <laughs> I would We're going to move on to the business beat. The effects of the stalled auto bailout are felt here. Downtown office vacancies could rise by 50% by 2010, and Sears is counting on holiday sales for their very survival. Uh, Tom Hudson, explain to me, is this a Sears last stand? Uh, it, well, it's, it's not only, it could be Sears last stand. A lot of uh, retailers, I think, are in this situation where it's all or nothing between now and really the end of January when the holiday season technically wraps up for a lot of the gift card giving and what happens over the next couple of weeks. We've been speaking to... Would you, I want to stop you right there and go down this panel. Would you buy a Sears gift card for somebody? You know, now that you mention it, I mean, uh, I wasn't going to give anything, but now just yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> you, you, I'm tightening the yeah. belt. Yeah, you, you probably could no, use. No, but I mean, uh, would you buy it, John yeah, I mean, Hilkovich, you know, if I mean, thinking I mean, that it that might not be here when you want to redeem it? I haven't been in a Sears in years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just not on my radar screen when I'm thinking of uh, shopping. Uh, and I think a lot of people are in that same boat, despite the well-known brands of the Ken Moores and the Craftsman. It's just not on the on the radar, and Sears is trying to pull out all the stops. Remember, Sears is also Kmart as well, mm -hmm. trying to put out all the stops to try to get those shoppers in and buy the gift cards or whatever it and may be. And one of the big problems with this now is that you've got an ownership which seems to be treating Sears and Kmart for the value of its of real its estate. holdings, right. its real estate, Which can't not, have gone up. not running it as a retailer. And I have a serious question about whether you can survive like that. Well, there's, there's huge questions about those retailers that do have a footprint. And those footprints, the value of those real estate holdings are going continually to go down. Yeah. And then the value of any kind of revenues coming in through the end of the year continue do you, do to you go down. Do you believe that we're going into some kind of a deflationary period? Which uh, means that the value of their inventories is also yeah. going down. Absolutely. I, I do not think we're going into a deflationary period, despite the fact that we'll see continued constriction on the consumer and a lot of people holding back their holiday spending. We're still ultimately a consuming economy here in the United States and people will still spend money. Instead, I think longer term, we're, we're potentially into a hyperinflation. If no spending kind of, it, if no one's spending the money. Well, they're not spending it because they don't have it. Uh, or maybe they think that the uh, prices will go down. Uh, potentially that could be, especially when it comes to large purchases like cars and like real estate. And they are going down. And they are going down significantly. You're right. And this also poses a problem for the Fed where they have to be careful about lowering interest rates even further because the more they do that, the more you start to create a deflationary uh, well, kind of situation. Let's talk about the auto bailout. Uh, uh, you know, everybody thinks it's a Washington problem, but as we look around, it's a high-risk problem for more than two dozen states throughout the country, including here in Illinois. 40,000 jobs are directly tied to the automotive industry. There are, are uh, more than 12,000 companies that are auto parts suppliers spread throughout Illinois. This is an issue that's not only for Detroit and Michigan and the Rust Belt. This is an issue that goes throughout the entire Give nation. some examples of uh, things in Illinois and in the Chicago area. Well, you've got obviously the auto dealers, you've got the delivery companies, you've got the manufacturers that are based throughout in some of the exurbs, you've got the auto parts suppliers, you've got simply the mechanics as well, and, and, and all of the type of service industries that are associated with the auto and industry. you have Chrysler up in uh, Belvedere, That's which right. is near Rockford. That's right, the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, and Ford uh, in the city. And, uh, and w but 
a lot of people think that uh, for the bailout purpose, they're exaggerating the number of jobs. Is that is that uh, I true? don't get the sense that the number of jobs is being exaggerated. I mean, it's exaggerated. going from, from uh, 2.5 to 3 million. That's $500,000 swing. What happened to those $500,000? Well, how do you want jobs? to define related to the auto industry, right? And, and I think one of the concerns uh, and one of the criticisms of the auto industry's effort to try to get this $25 billion is the threat, especially from General Motors and Ford, that bankruptcy is not an option, that instead liquidation would be our only well, option if we that, don't that, get this but bailout. That's, isn't that the Sears example? I mean, would you buy a car from a company that's going to go bankrupt? Absolutely not. And or, or would I buy a car the way many of our American cars are made? I, I think, I th <laughs> which goes to the bigger point, right? I think we all flew on airlines yeah. which were bankrupt at right. a time. Yeah. Uh, we didn't stop doing commerce with airlines that were bankrupt. Yeah, Why would we did, stop you necessarily? You didn't have to uh, go back to the airline uh, to get some warranty work. Well, we did. I mean, you, when you the would buy. Was over, you, were done. you would buy your ticket six, eight weeks, uh, six, eight months, perhaps in the future, well, expecting true. that airline to still be flying. But when these auto industry execs flew to Washington in their private place <laughs> this week, right. they just put on an awful show. Mm -hmm. they, they weren't promising more efficient cars or better made automobiles. And that's, that's the issue. true. Where's that money going? $25 billion to what? To the fat cats? Or is it going right. to the employees? To jobs? Or to a better product? Because or, people are not going to stop. Or just go into the payroll without any changing of the business. Yeah, that's exactly right. what Wait, Congress wants to hear is what's the, the strategy for the yeah, right. $25 Where's billion? Dollars? And because really, is this just a mandate <coughs> on open heart surgery? They have Can to you give me a 15 second uh, answer on uh, why office vacancies are going to be down 50% uh, by 2010? But financial services continue to constrict. Okay, that's 15 seconds. <laughs> We're going over to the Week in Review, and now here's John Calloway with Friday Night. Thank you, Joel, and good evening. This past Halloween, Chicago legend Studs Terkel died late in the day. That evening, in tribute, we rebroadcast my last interview with Studs. We had originally planned to bring you an interview with Sven Gulli, actor Rich Coase, on Halloween night. Instead, we have that program for you now. We'll bring you into the world of Sven Gulli, the longtime Chicago master of postmodern vaudeville, that vamp for vampires. Many of you may have, over the years, watched Rich host those Sven Gulli movie breaks for horror movies, profound exercises in broadcast silliness. How did Rich come to be Sven Gulli? What drives Sven Gulli's popular appeal? Why do horror films continue to fascinate us? Answers to those and other questions from Rich Coase, next on Friday Night. Rich Coase, welcome to Friday Night. Thank you, Janet. It's an honor to be here. Happy Halloween. And the same to you. You didn't wear a costume? It's, it's really, I think it is one of the most remarkable things here on Halloween, and we have you, Rich Coase, Vin Goli, Vin Gooley. <laughs> yes, it's Gooley it's all the same. Is it true that you're not particularly into Halloween? Oh, yeah, well, usually when I'm at home, I try to avoid answering the door because it's only trouble, you know, because the first thing you get is, aren't you Sven Gooley? Are you going to give me a rubber chicken? And on and on and on. And then if I do answer the door, then the word spreads. They go, do you know who answered the door at that house? And so I'm much more content to let my family answer the door and I just but stay But doesn't in the, the moat protect you from <laughs> Well, some yes, of but that? they've learned to bridge the moat. That's the problem. Last year they put jello in it and they could just walk right across. When you were a kid, were you into Halloween? Oh yeah, I really enjoyed it. I looked forward to coming up with some sort of costume, either creating one or buying one and, you know, going out and hitting all the houses. That's that's what's so different these days. It seems like you know, we used to go out and just endlessly trick or treat, and now everything is very regimented. You may only trick or treat from, you know, 4 p.m. Yeah. to 7 p.m. <laughs> it's, it's like a nuclear arms agreement. <laughs> you'll do this, is. and you'll do this then, Except et with more chocolate, and you won't have too much fun, and we'll remind you you're vulnerable, et That's cetera. That's right. Now, yes. did you take your daughter, Stephanie, to trick or, trick or treat? Yeah, I did. When she was smaller, we used to go with her, and she was she was very happy to just go to a few houses around there. She's not really into candy that much. What a child. She's not, <laughs> not into candy, but she, uh, she always enjoyed dressing up in different costumes and still does, in fact. When you were a kid, did you do any of the uh, mischief stuff? Only to try to, you know, bother people in the neighborhood right from our house. I didn't really go around, you, didn't, you know, ringing and running. Of course, running so you didn't grow up where like I grew up in West Virginia, where you literally could go out and turn over an outhouse. <laughs> no, actually. You know, one hopes with nobody in it. Well, one hopes so, yeah. But I think the, the most mischievous thing that I did was I dressed up as a scarecrow and sat on our front stoop 
and waited for you know people to come along and then you know do some movement and scare them. And I remember one kid coming along and, and going, "Hey, let's kick it!" And as soon as I moved, he moved rather quickly away. So I, I guess I pulled one over on him. For those who don't know, Sven Gulli, what's what are the origins of? Sven Gulli. Well, they go back many years to Transylvania. No, that's <laughs> not really it. Originally, I'm sorry. <laughs> and he hits me with a chicken, which now is down so low, okay. I cannot bend to get it. <laughs> Originally, Jerry G. Bishop, a television personality and radio personality here in town, was working at Channel 32 and just happened to be the voiceover announcer on some Friday night horror movies. And he started doing his announcements in a strange accent that he always described as a cross between the Transylvanian and Yiddish. <laughs> and, <laughs> excuse me, eventually uh, they came up with the name Sven Gulli, and it went from just being voiceover announcements to him talking over slide pictures of himself and eventually a full-fledged video program. And during that time, I was a student at Northwestern, and I was just a fan of his. I enjoyed his radio work and TV work, and I just started sending him material. And he wrote back to me and said, this is great, send me some more. And eventually, uh, he said, come on down to the station. I understand you're, you're a broadcast student. Why don't you come down here and you know, hang around during a taping? And from then on, I, I hung around with him. Uh, he would specifically request different bits of material. C can you do a parody of this commercial or whatever? And ended up working with him on that show. And then when he went to WMAQ Radio, I was his sidekick producer and did all different voices. And about 80% of the goofy people he talked to on the radio were me. <laughs> and uh, eventually Jerry was going to move to San Diego. And at that time I had been working with him and also with Dick Orkin, a uh, oh, wonderful yeah. radio personality. The great Dick Orkin. Yes, and I learned so much from him as well. And uh, Jerry was leaving and he said, well, you know, what are you planning on doing? And I said, well, maybe I'll try to, you know, sell somebody on a TV show or something here locally. And we had talked about doing a Son of Sven Gulli show. Which that, that became the first that was iteration the, of Yes, it. that was the name. Because Jerry originally said, you know, if we do this show, I want to just produce it and work with you on writing it and things like that, because he felt that someday he might actually run for office, ah. some local office, and he didn't want... President Bishop said today. <laughs> his, his opponent say, holding up the picture of him, the Svengooli garb, saying, this is what my learned opponent did in a previous lifetime. So he didn't want to, and he figured I could be, which was a very big compliment, that I could carry the character as well. Well, that's, for those who... There may be a couple of people who aren't familiar with this. Let's look at the videotape okay. now of Zinguli. Get set for the wizardry of the Wolfman, but he does seem similar to a more contemporary character. I mean, think about it. Magic charms. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh-huh. An attack that leaves him with an unusual scar. Uh, oh, beautiful. I mean, don't you see who he is? He's Harry Potter. Oh. You see, Harry Potter, he's Harry, and, and his pals are like Ron oh, Weasley, it's really like a weasel, another furry animal, and his gal pal is Hermione, Hermione, did you get that, it's got, oh, and I'm Dumbledore, <laughs> I am a Dumbledore, here comes the original Wolfman, Jack, <laughs> you know I was going to say that, didn't you, okay, we're out of chickens already, we might have get to the movie then, okay. How long does it take to put on the makeup? Well, I've kind of streamlined it a little bit. It takes about 35 to 40 minutes to put it on. And it used to take about uh, almost 55 minutes to put it on. And would you put it on or would somebody else put oh, it on? Oh, I put it on. I've always put it on. And you've done a lot of your own writing. Is it true that you did your own set design? I mean, were you just well, Mr. Do-It-All? To some extent, yeah. Uh, I actually designed the coffin back in the days when uh, Jerry was doing the show. I actually <laughs> had to paint over the face and paint my face over his when I took over the show. Is, tell us about the tradition of having a comic interrupt a horror show. I mean, did that start in Chicago? Actually, it started in the 1950s, I believe maybe in New York or Los Angeles. It was either John Zacherly, the very famous Zacherly, or Vampira, the uh, female who showed up in some of those Ed Wood movies. And they were the main hosts there. Here in Chicago, we had, uh, oh, I, I can't remember, Shock Theater. Oh, yeah. And that was hosted by Terry Bennett. And he was not necessarily a vampire character, but kind of a beatnik character. And he would uh, be hosting the movies as, as the comic relief or whatever. 
And this all happened because Universal released a bunch of their movies to television to help fill time. It was called the Shock Package, hence the name Shock <coughs> Theater. Thank and th this spread all over the country. There were hosts everywhere, and they would, uh, you know. So this interrupt. is cheap programming, ra rather inexpensive programming mm -hmm. for stations, a lot of independent stations that maybe don't have big local programming budgets. Exactly. It was it was a way to kind of add an additional element to the movies. I always felt that it's kind of comic relief because sometimes, you know, maybe for younger viewers, it's a little intense, and you you want to do something that's going to take some of the, you know. Some of the tension out of it. But do you get people who call in or write complaining about the interruptions? Oh, certainly. I mean, you do know, they take it seriously? There are some who do take it seriously. I remember one of my friends pointing out to me once a website where there was somebody who had seen me and, and this guy was just livid and like, who needs a jerk like this? How can you make fun of the creature from the Black Lagoon? <laughs> in, thinking, in other words, well, you're interrupting art. That's right. To some people, I, I'm causing all major problems. And there are times when we've done things like add sound effects. And, oh my goodness, there Don't are people... Don't mess with the art. Do not mess with the art. Even if the art is something that when you're sitting there watching it without the interruptions, people are going to be going, is it over yet? Can I go to sleep? Well, I was just, I was just going to say, don't many people tune in to see you, to see you. They'll take a little of the movie, but they want to see Rich. Well, yeah, I guess that is true. There's, there's often been mail that I get that says, we don't care what the movie is. We just want to see what you're doing and what bits you're doing. And it's, it's, you know, it's funny because when we do have the good movies, I mean, recently we were able to get the universal classics like Frankenstein and Dracula. And it was nice because I thought, here we're presenting these which haven't been on regular broadcast TV for over 20 years, probably. And there are people who have never been exposed to them. And I thought it's great that they're in there. But still, I'm getting letters from people saying, we don't care about Frankenstein. We just want to see what you're doing. But there's others who might say, now that you've got the real classics, mm -hmm. uh, stay out of the way, Rich. Yeah. And, and, and do you tailor your material accordingly? Do you, do you accord more respect, as it were, to the great horror movies than maybe some of the cheaper stuff? Certainly stars? so. I think we, we, if we have something that is a uh, shoestring budget that was direct to video, I'm not going to exactly be, you know, doing grand hasanas to it. Uh, with the new, the new stuff, it's like, you know, okay, whatever. But when you've got those classics, we've tried to really run them without taking out any of the movie as much as possible. And, you know, making sure that each segment is clear, you can see the whole scene, and then I come in afterwards. And, and you know, I, a lot of times I'm not so much making fun of it as having fun with it. You're having fun with it or around it. Yeah, exactly. Is, is there something that I'm, I'm not, I have to confess to you, I'm not yes. the biggest horror film mm -hmm. fan in the world. And I'm not into vampires and all that stuff. What am I missing, Rich? I, what are you missing? I don't know. I think it might be that you're just content with your life and you don't need to be scared, John. Because I've always You've looked at You've got the financial crisis. Isn't that scary? <laughs> well, maybe that's you know, enough for you, though. You know, real life is enough. enough. Yeah. I've always thought of horror movies as kind of a roller coaster ride where you're gonna go with the ups and downs and it's thrilling and it's frightening, but you know by the end of it, you're gonna be fine. You're not hurt. But you, you could go, we could go into universities where this stuff is taught and they would take us way, way back uh, to the medieval times, et cetera, would they not? And tell us about why these stories are so powerful and why they are a rich part of our psyche. Yeah. I, I mean, I there's a whole academic side of this also, is there not? Sure, and it's that whole idea that there could be these things that are so incredibly supernatural and so frightening that, you know, how do we know they don't exist? And people have such an interest in that. You know, the, there are people that really do believe that vampires roam the earth and that there are werewolves. And the same people who are watching for the UFOs that, that come by. Uh, these people feel that there's, there's a lot of power in these characters. And the New York Times, for example, the august New York Times, did a huge piece on Thursday about houses that have ghosts haunted houses oh, and they sure. quoted all of these really sincere people about the ghosts i mean by the time i finished that article i thought yeah you're right there are haunted houses oh, i sure. mean they really convinced what what's your take on that well there are any number of tv shows now especially on cable where they have these people who are ghost hunters or uh, people in england who go to haunted places and it's always fun to watch these because these people will set up elaborate you know, cameras in the dark and such, and be sitting there and constantly be going, did you hear that? 
And it's like, you know, you can't hear it because the soundtrack music is too high anyway. <laughs> and they're invariably, look, that just moved over there. But the camera is aimed at them and not at whatever moved, so we never get to see that. But do you personally, do Rich I believe Coes, in ghosts? Then go do you believe in ghosts? Well, John, I must say I've never experienced any ghosts, although they've taken some pictures where it appears there's some ghosts in them. But other than that, I, I don't know for sure. I, I'm open is to Is your anything. mind open on it? My mind is open, yes. Just as I, I wouldn't be surprised if a UFO landed tomorrow. <laughs> In fact, it's scheduled for a That's about, right, yeah. Uh, Here on our very shoe. Uh, I think, sure, these things can exist. There can be aliens. There can be, there might be vampires. I, I don't know if I believe that as strongly as I would believe that there might be ghosts. Are you superstitious? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I don't think I am. That's very interesting. Now. As a part of your humor, mm -hmm. you make fun of certain things in certain places. Mm -hmm. One of them is the great, great community of Berwyn, Illinois. Let's look at a little piece of videotape and then come back and you have to defend yourself, sir. Okay. <laughs> How did you come to pick on Berwyn? Well, it's, it's an old family tradition, going back to the original Sven Gulli, Jerry G. Bishop. When Jerry started with the Sven Gulli business, he felt that there should be some, at the time, Rowan and Martin's Laughing was winding down, and they used to make jokes, as well as Johnny Carson, about beautiful downtown Burbank, you know, small oh, town yes. type jokes. Right. And Jerry thought there should be a local equivalent. Now also, and I was not aware of this until recently, the very famous horror host in Cleveland, Goulardi, Ernie Anderson, also would pick on a local suburb there, I believe it was Parma, and would use that as his small town joke target. And Jerry figured there should be a local equivalent, and he thought of the place that had, at the time, a yearly parade in honor of mushrooms, and uh, whose main, one of their main streets seemed to be lined with uh, savings and loans and used car lots, and felt this would be the perfect place for him to, you know, bring up. Now, as it's gone along, I have tried to, you know, I, I've been to Berwyn many times, and most of the people there really, really seem you to You could probably run it. for mayor of Berwyn, I, you? I don't know. I don't think the mayor might be that fond of that. But uh, it, the people there like it. It's a nice community, a very, you know, down-to-earth, working-class community. It's a beautiful place, and every time I do interviews, I bring that up. I purposely bring it up. Because I don't want people to think, oh, you know, Berwyn, it's a joke. Because it really isn't a joke. So it's you've nice gone place. back there several times. I you've have waited been there right many into times. the taking your life in your hands. I, no, actually, it's, it's quite safe for me. And even the mayor will come up and shake hands and say hello. So I, I don't you, think I have to worry. Do you do a lot of personal appearances? Yeah, I really do. Uh, that, that's why my throat sounds the way it does. Well, you have a little cold today. Coughing. Yes, a little bit. I apologize. But, but tell us about your fans. I, I saw I saw part of your Facebook, and then all of these people are just worshiping you. Oh, well, that's nice of you to say. I'm very lucky in that I guess I ended up appealing to a very wide range of people. There are people who were kids when I first started who are now adults, and the nicest thing I ever hear from them is, I used to watch you when I was a kid, now I watch you with my kids. Uh -huh. And the fact that they're still watching, they don't consider it just kid stuff, and the fact that their kids are watching as well, is, is a big tribute to me. When I go and do these appearances, and for two hours straight, I'm just signing because the line is going, and we have to actually cut off the line. That's, that's amazing to me, that these people have this devotion, and, and it, it's very touching to me. Is it amazing to you, or touching to you, that you've won eight Emmys and have been honored in the Silver Circle Awards for the TV Academy? It is very touching, and it's, it's, it is amazing to me. I, I, have to, I have to tell you that when... Yes. Whenever you're, you were a presenter at the recent yes. Emmys, mm -hmm. whenever your name is mentioned, there is the biggest, warmest response to you. Oh, it must, that must feel great. It's very flattering to me that people in the business 
actually appreciate what I do. I'm always astounded when I run into somebody in the business that I myself see on TV or in radio, and they say, oh yeah, I, I just saw you the other, and they quote me something back from some bit or something like that. That's extremely flattering to me. Every time I see Tom Skilling, oh, yeah. he just waxes ebullient about this. Tom Spindolian makes you feel thing. good to be alive, doesn't he? He does, and he also gives me a five-day forecast, which is very <laughs> useful at the time. That's, that's, uh, that's very nice. Now, play movie critic for a minute okay. and give us your top horror movies of all time wow. and why. Um, I like the original Dracula just because of the atmosphere. There is something to that black and white photography and the fact that Lugosi with that accent really does seem very otherworldly. I, I enjoy watching that movie over and over again and just because the visuals are so great. I like some of the current stuff, well, not current, but some of the more modern stuff, like Nightmare on Elm Street, the very first one, before it got, you know, too wisecracky and, you know, Freddy Krueger became Bob Hope. It, uh, <laughs> you, of all people, criticizing somebody <laughs> for being wisecracky. <laughs> what, who, me? Surely you jest. Uh, I liked seeing that, and that type of stuff especially, I think, adds to what we were talking about earlier about why people like horror movies. Uh, the old horror movies always seem to be, you know, off in Romania or in England. Right. Whereas things like Nightmare on Elm Street and Halloween brought it right home. It's like this could be happening right, you know, in your backyard. And I, I'm very impressed by movies like that. There are other people, younger people on cable stations doing mm -hmm. the kind of thing you do, mm -hmm. only they're doing them with kind of main street, mainstream movies. It, maybe mm -hmm. it's Sleepless in Seattle. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, the... The, the segment ends and you come out to some cute couple and they're talking, well, he shouldn't have called her. Yes, you know, he'll, he get, he'll, he'll fall in love with her if he doesn't watch out. <laughs> Do you ever see those? Yeah, kids? I've seen quite a few of those. And it's just taking the whole thing of hosted movies. I think that even while there were the hosted horror movies, there were also just regular movies being hosted by people in various cities. I know for a while it was a big thing to do the sort of dialing for dollars thing where somebody would, or prize movie, where in the breaks someone would be calling someone at home and asking if they knew what, you know, today's count was, you know, because they'd say yeah, the count is three up. I don't know what that means. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, and, and you see that a lot on cable, or else they're doing makeovers in between parts of the movies. The other series which you have paid attention to is that great intellectual scientific public policy series called the Three Stooges. Yes. What's, what, what's your fascination, or maybe, you, maybe you're not personally fascinated with them? Actually, I am. I am, and that started when I was a kid. I always remember going to uh, my great aunt and uncle's house who raised my mom, and my uncle would just love the Stooges, but he wouldn't be allowed to put them on more or less unless the kids wanted to see them. So he would go, they were Italian, he'd go, hey, you want to watch the Stooges? And so the Stooges would be put on. And my great aunt, who was just a saint and a lovely woman, thought it was all real. So when Mo was slapping Curly or Larry, she'd be going, oh my goodness, what is he doing there? And then when he would get hit back by them, she'd go, good for him, the bigger boss, good for him. And I always remember that, and that was added entertainment. But I, I like the Stooges because it, it's very silly stuff. And if you get past some of the slapstick, although I do enjoy and some And you of the mean slap. Uh, literally slapstick. There's some very funny lines of dialogue in there. And as there's well. some real movement and talent there. Oh, oh, certainly. When you look at, at like Curly Howard or Shemp Howard, these guys were, were very funny actors and great improvisers. And, and yet you get a sense today that it's kind of, there, there are probably people who are politically incorrect to see some of that stuff going where they really haul off and. Oh, each certainly, other. yeah, and we've even done a show that I think we're going to rerun called Censored Stooges that goes through some of the things that they did, some things that were very violent, things that were, are no longer politically correct that were in those shorts, but there weren't a lot of those movies back then. As you know, it, it was just the way that things were. It was before people really had a conscience about that you stuff. You talk about being a kid. Where did you grow up? I grew up first, uh, born in Chicago until about the age of four we lived there and then we moved wait, up wait, to the wait, North where? suburbs. Wait, 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 where? Chicago's a uh, big city. West Side, Sawyer Avenue, I believe, was where we lived. Right near Moore School, which I only attended uh, kindergarten at. And then you moved to? Then we moved to the Morton Grove area and I spent most of my time there. Went to Main East High School in Park Ridge. Was that a good experience? Yeah, actually it was. That was where I first started broadcasting. They had an FM station and I had never thought really about 
being a radio personality, and once I got involved with that, I thought, you know, that this is something that I could actually do. I didn't realize that people could actually have jobs like that. Tell me about your parents. My parents, my mom and dad, uh, my mom from an Italian family, my dad from a Polish and German family, very hardworking people who always took care of us, made sure that we had whatever we needed, but also... Was your mother uh, a homemaker? Yes, yes. What did your dad do? My dad was a sheet metal worker. He worked in the uh, metal trade, making duct work and things like that. Where does your, where does your sense of comedy come from? I, I think it if comes we, from both of them. They both had really good senses of humor and said very funny things. Did you read a newspaper at home when you were growing up? Yeah, I'd read the newspaper Did, I mean, every day. Because you're, you're up on current events also, is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. I, I, I always read the newspaper. I always enjoyed reading the newspaper, and it's something that every day I make sure that I do, every morning. What was the low point of your career? Low point in my career, I would say, was when I was uh, fired for the first time from WFLD, right at the time when my daughter was going to be born, and then she was born with uh, minor spina bifida, yes, mm. and it mainly affected her kidneys and bladder, and it was a time when it seemed like there was nobody that was interested in hiring me. And that How did you survive? I did as much freelance work as possible and uh, did, you know, any little job that came along. And, it and was Stephanie had tough. a kidney transplant? Yes, yeah, so four years ago she had a kidney transplant. What's she doing today? She is going to school. She's interested in fashion display and fashion, uh, fashion management. Well, good for her. And your show is on Saturday nights at 9 o'clock? Yes, Saturday nights at on 9 o'clock. On Channel 26, WCIU? On Yes, the U, as we like to the call it. The U. And you want to say a nice word about Neil Saban? I would, actually. He's the whole reason that I'm there. Uh, we had a lunch right before he was taking the helm there, and uh, we hit it off very, very well. He, he comes up with some great stuff. He has a great respect for the whole local programming aspect, and he grew up watching the same kind of stuff that I do, and uh, he realizes how important it is to those people at home to have that local connection. And he's been uh, kind enough, along with the Shapiro family that runs the station, to let me continue doing this because they know it's important to the viewers. Oh, it's great fun. You've had a great career, Rich. Thanks so much for being with Thank us. Thank you. Is my career over? No, 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 no. It's oh, just getting okay. started. I'll tell you about that after we go off camera. Thank you very much. I'm John Calloway. Thank you, and good night. Closed captioning for this program is made possible by the generous support of Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a personal injury firm. You can watch this program again anytime you want on Comcast On Demand. I will not deal while this country stands on the brink of annihilation. See, I never want to lose you. Martin Sheen stars in Kennedy. Saturday at 8 on WTTW 11. Next time on Nature, Ernest Seaton was hired. Remember to be good boys and girls. Christmas will soon be here. Remember to tune in tomorrow for another Letters to Santa. Be good boys and girls. Bye-bye. Merry Christmas. Huh?
Many of Milwaukee Public Television's local productions can be seen at any time on MPTV On Demand, Channel 1111 on Time Warner Cable. Hi, it's time for... Hi, I'm Mark Walburn. Where do you go to find antiques? Auctions? Flea markets? How about the local dump? Oh, so you're a dump diver? I'm a dump rat, yes. She saw the pot on the side of the road, and she just picked it off. Nice piece of garbage on the yeah. curb of Madison, Wisconsin. <laughs> Don't miss our special edition Antiques Roadshow, Trash to Treasure. See it tonight at 7 on MPTV 10 HD. Have you heard about the transition to digital television? Maybe you still have a few questions, like, do I need to buy a new television? Will satellite and cable TV be affected? What's the difference between DTV and HDTV? Well, PBS and this old house have teamed up to answer these questions and to help with the transition to digital broadcasting. Tune into this special program to find out what's changing and what you need to do to get ready. See it tonight at 8 on MPTV 10 HD. Tis the season for a Dance in America treat, filled with holiday delight. All the magic and sparkle, the unforgettable music. Join host Christy Yamaguchi for San Francisco Ballet's dreamy new Nutcracker on great performances. Wednesday night at 7 on MPTV 10 HD. In February 2009, analog television will go dark. Will your television be ready? On Wednesday, December 17th, MPTV 10 will conduct a test to determine if your TV set is ready for digital signals. The test will take place at 6.58 p.m. You will want to check all the television sets in your household at that time to determine if you are ready. Also, stay tuned all evening on Wednesday, December 17th, as we will broadcast live cut-ins from the DTV phone bank that will answer all of your DTV questions. For more information, log on to mptv.org or call area code 414-297-7520. This is WMBS-DT, Milwaukee Public Television, Channel 10-1. Television broadcasts in Milwaukee began more than 60 years ago. We'll look back at a battle for the TV channels that reflect on some of your favorite programming over the years with author Dick Golubyevsky next on I Remember. I'm Jim Peck. Welcome to I Remember. Joining me is Dick Golombievsky, author of a new book, Milwaukee Television History, The Analog Years. As television completes its move to a digital medium, it's a good time to reflect on how local broadcasting got its start and how much it's changed over the years. Take a look. In the early days of television, it was a thrill to gather around the small screen with your family. Department store displays had previewed what was to come. Many recall when Gordon Hinckley emceed a music show featuring Joe Schott and the Hot Shots. Bretta Green showed us what's new in the kitchen, and Merle Dusing Safari led us on some exotic adventures. Wrestling and other sports were always popular. In the late 40s, WTMJ even featured Brewers Minor League Baseball from Borchard Field. For children, Foreman Tom was a big draw. Another local favorite was Mac the Mailman, played by Ward Chase. In the early days of WMVS, there was a variety show called Children's Fair. Teachers on romper room stations gave lessons on how to be a doobie instead of a don't be. Barbara Becker hosted some lovable puppets on Cartoon Alley. The puppeteer was Jack Dublon, and the most famous was Albert the Alley Cat, who had a long run on the Channel 6 weather segments. Howard and Rosemary Gurnett hosted Dialing for Dollars on Channel 12. 
The Great Circus Parade first aired on Milwaukee Public Television in 1963. WMVS staff and students, including a young Bob Berry, also put together instructional programming. All local television was live until Channel 10 began using a recording device called a kinescope. And for years, stations had staff announcers read their copy live from the booth. In 1947, WTMJ began broadcasting on Channel 3, not Channel 4. Long ago, there was a CBS affiliate called WCAN-TV. During the competition for local VHF and UHF channels, there was once a WOKY-TV. Later called WXIX-TV, it started on Channel 19 and moved to Channel 18, now the home of WVTV. Channel 12 was WTVW before it became WISN. WCGV first went on the air in 1980 on Channel 24. In 1983, WVCY, the Wisconsin voice of Christian youth, began broadcasting. In 88, WDJT, incorporating the initials of original licensees Deborah Jackson and John Torres, went on the air as Channel 58. The background story of local broadcasting, including Low Power WMLW and Telemundo, Wisconsin, is the topic of Dick Goemievsky's book, Milwaukee Television History, The Analog Years. When did television actually start in Milwaukee? Experiments started in the 1930s. The journal company um, had purchased some mechanical scanning equipment, and there had been in the late 20s kind of a boom minor boom in Chicago, New York, and some other cities with mechanical television, which had a screen you know, a couple of inches, mm -hmm. um, and that was it. And, and th so they conducted experiments at the top of the Schrader Hotel um, for about three years. And then the journal company applied for the very first commercial television license in 1938. They didn't get it, but they uh, continued, and they finally got a, an experimental license again and the early 40s, and um, then World War II put it all on hold, and then there were starts and stops uh, with the journal company, and they finally went on the air on the 3rd of December, 1947. 1947. What were we seeing if we were sitting around watching television in 1947? You would have seen some interesting things. First of all, um, younger viewers might not relate to this, but the FCC required that stations broadcast 30 hours a week. How many? 30. 30 hours for the entire week? For the entire week. Okay. Now you say, well, that's a day and six hours. Just about, yeah. Well, back then, Hollywood films hadn't been released to TV. There wasn't much in the way of syndicated programming, and there were no networks. So what they did in the afternoon, now, of course, you were at uh, the journal company, WTMJ-TV, in the 70s. Yes, indeed, in television. Sure. And you were there when they had the auditorium. Yep. So they had a show, for instance, they had two cameras. And they had a show called Meet Your Neighbor. Now, I remember the, that title, but I don't remember the show. What was it? They would sit in the auditorium, and people would come to the auditorium, and they would interview them. So the man on the street, it was man in the auditorium, or woman. Who did the interviews? Do you, do you remember? Uh, the staff announcers at the time, which might have been Bob Heiss or whoever was there, uh, Larry Clark, a number of others. Uh, you used the phrase, uh, staff announcers. That's something that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, no. Nope. Tell, tell us, who the, what was a staff announcer? A staff announcer, as you well know, because you were one. That's how I got in. Um, was someone who was a jack of all trades, or Jill of all trades, as, it, as appropriate. Uh, they might pull a stint in the booth. And so they were the people who, at the top of the hour, says, you're watching WMVS television, Channel 10, Milwaukee and did a legal ID, and they would read commercial copy over a slide. Right. Or because so much of the programming was on film, they would uh, have to run that through something called a film chain. Uh -huh. And very often that film would break. And then we would say, please stand by. We're experiencing technical difficulties. Please stand by. We will be back to our regular program in just yeah, a minute. However much time it's going to take us. But they kept, the booth announcers kept the logs. Right. And then they might do other shows because there are a variety of sh locally produced shows at the time. And those locally produced shows happened because in many cases that's all they could come up with. There wasn't the variety of syndicated programming. For instance, Channel so all fly by the seat of your pants, really. Yep. Nobody's done this before, so let's put let's get people walking in and I'll sit down and interview you and find out why you showed up at the station today. 
you may not have a very interesting story, so I've got to make it interesting. And that's right. where people like Bob Heiss and Larry Clark were so brilliant. And um, what they would do is even, for instance, Spr late Spr Sprague Lanier, who we just found out passed away on Halloween, told me that for a while at Channel 4, they would lock down a camera in front of a goldfish bowl because they didn't want to turn the cameras off. They were tube cameras, and they took a while to warm up. And, of course, television sets were tubes, and they took a while to warm up. So they locked a camera down. The problem was the union was a little upset because their contract said whenever there was live action, you had to have a cameraman. And they and didn't the, want to have a camera. Fish, was, live fish was considered. They sure. lost. They lost the suit. The union won because it was considered to be a live action. Oh, that's funny. Um, I can remember walking around neighborhoods because we didn't have a set, and you'd walk around at night. You'd, you'd look for that blue flicker. Right. And you'd go up and, and you'd, if you knew the people, you'd knock on the door and say, "Can we watch?" Well, and or you'd peek through the window. Department stores or oh, yeah. whatever would have it in the window, yep. and people would just stand out there. I remember watching a boxing match. Uh, in front of a TV store, and it was cold. It was winter time, and I, I darn near got frozen. But I, we, I stood out there and watched this thing. Now, you couldn't hear any audio, but you could see it. The first color broadcast by uh, NBC. Well, it wasn't the first, but it was the first formal color broadcast by NBC. Happened on, on January 1st, the Tournament of Roses parade in either 53 or 54. I need my book to find out what yes. this was. And there was, a, there was a store in town that had a Halicrafters color television set, and the police had to be called because the crowd had grown to such an extent that it was uh, causing a problem. It wasn't a riot, but it was, it was a crowd control issue. Well, imagine also the other thing is people started pushing forward, mm -hmm. and you're on a glass window. Yeah. This is not a good idea. Right. <clears throat> when you have a couple hundred people standing behind. But I don't think people... People who didn't grow up in that era have no idea how exciting it was. There was a thing called a test pattern. Describe, please, the test pattern. A test pattern was a series of lines. In black and white, it was a series of lines and a series of shadings that you could use to adjust the focus and the um, balance on the television, the technical adjustments. And they would put those up periodically throughout the day, very often for at least an hour or two before they went on the air. And right. And back when we signed off, which they don't do anymore, um, I think only WVCY TV signs off now, um, they'd have it perhaps uh, afterwards. And, and I would get up and watch it. I, my brother and I used to get up at 5.30 in the morning and watch <laughs> the Channel 6 test pattern, yes. driving my parents nuts because we would watch the test pattern that early in the morning. It, it was it was just and people was I mean television was going to be the end of family life because they would stop all conversation and people would never be together again. Yeah, it was amazing. It was going to kill radio. Yeah, that yeah. was going to be the end of it, and uh, it was a flash in the pan because it would never supplant mo uh, movie, theaters. movie theaters. And then eventually it was going to push movie theaters out of business, which the theaters were seriously worried about. Oh yeah, at the time. Yeah, and in fact, they uh, the theater owners threatened to boycott Hollywood studios who would release their films to television. Most people, I think, nowadays don't realize that uh, the films weren't released to television, Hollywood films, until really the mid to late 50s. Before that, there were very few that were released. Let's go back a little bit, uh, again, because the, the early days fascinated me, and, and you had wonderful characters, and you had shows that, well, for example, here in Milwaukee, Wrestling, or wrestling, as it was called, wrestling. was one of the most popular shows on television. This was way before the WWE, whatever it is, SmackDown, right. all that stuff. It was popular for several reasons. Number one, uh, you had these great characters. Professional wrestling and television were made for each other. The, very, the second night WTMJ was on the air, TV, they took the cameras from Meet Your Neighbor, uh -huh. had to break them down, put on some film programming, Drive to the Southside Armory, which was on 6th and Lapham. That's it, the Southside Armory. Which was not an easy drive in the days before freeways. Now you just go down the freeway. There weren't any at the time. And they, they had a wrestling show for two hours on Thursday nights, sponsored by Gettleman Beer. That's right. Professional yeah. wrestling and television were made for each other. Professional wrestling was dying throughout the country. Really? When television came on, uh, they were looking for sports. They needed this programming. They had to be on 30 hours a week. So even then, though, they understood that sports would be a hook. Right. But wrestling was very important or very good for them because, A, it was in a confined area. Oh. The cameras were very big. Sure. They needed a lot of light. So the... Uh, and you've got big, big rig lights. Big rig lights. And the action was choreographed by the wrestlers. Of course, they didn't say that at the time. Of course but, not. But it's always amazing that they always wound up done in time. The matches ended in time for the commercials, and they ended on time. So oh, I, it, it was perfect for television. I remember Bob Heiss, who I, I knew slightly when I was just starting out. And he was the broadcaster for, for a lot of those early wrestling shows. And he would do sound effects. 
Yeah. When they would be twisting, he'd have a, a, a thing that would go around and... <laughs> so it's, and people would send him hate mail. Dennis James started that on the Dumont network. He really? Would, he would go to a butcher and he would get chicken bones. And so when someone had like a, a leg lock on someone, he would break the chicken bone. And oh. So people around the country picked up on this. And wrestling just took off. It has really never died. It's had its ups and downs, but in one way, shape, or form, it, it, it and the roller derby, to a lesser extent, uh, started with television from its Well, now it's huge. Days. Talk about some of the, the <coughs> local personalities. We talked about Bob Heiss. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, Gordon Hinckley hit town. I think it was the 1880s, yes. but I mentioned somewhere around yes. that. Uh, but he remembers yeah. those mechanical experiments, of course. Yes, exactly. But who are the other people on, on uh, early television? Oh, I think one of the biggest, of course, was Bill Carlson. Ah, yes. And Bill Carlson was um, actually on the very first WTMJ radio broadcast really? in 1927. He wow. was the leader of George Devine's Wisconsin Roof Orchestra. He later became, uh, his own orchestra became the WTMJ studio musicians when they had them on staff. Yep. You know, by the way, who his, the band singer was with his, uh, with his uh, no. orchestra? Mike Douglas. Really? Yes. Ah. And I, years ago, I interviewed Mike Douglas, and I said, I, we got talking, where are you from? I'm from Milwaukee. He said, oh, do you know Bill Carlson? And I said, yeah, I know Bill. He said, well, say hello. I said, how do you know him? That's how I found that out. Well, he learned to fly in 1930 because he could get from gig to gig easier. Ah. And then in World War II, when World War II happened, he quit music, and he um, became a civilian flight instructor during World War II. And then he went into the insurance business, and George Compt, who you knew, who yes. was head of uh, radio and television at uh, for the Journal Company. I knew well enough to call him by his first name, Mr. Mr. Yes. yes, Mr. Compt. Yes, as long as you didn't call uh, Walter Dam by his name. Ex yeah, yeah, that's we won't even go there. Yes, but um, he, um, George Compt, called him and, and asked him if he knew someone who could do a weather show, and Bill apparently said, "I can't think of anything, anyone but myself." Yes. So he was uniquely qualified because as an aviator, he had to know weather. And he was also an entertainer. And at the time, WTMJ Television had a monopoly on TV. The, all license applications had been frozen by the FCC. Uh -huh. So um, he went off, he had a monopoly, and he just took off. In fact, as, as uh, you well know, but our viewers may not, there was a time in the 1950s where he led the 10 p.m. newscast, weather led. Oh, sure. And, and they used to do horrible things to him. They yes. Would, they would play jokes on him. I remember I was working there in the early 70s. Just, he was just on the cusp of retiring. And one time he blew a, blew a, a weather forecast. Right. And it was, so it was a nice clear day. We got eight inches of snow. And he came on in his, that little insouciant way of his. And he <laughs> said, well, I guess I, that didn't come out too well. And we had snowballs. And we all let fly. And he loved it. Yeah. You could do anything to Bill on the air except compliment him. Yeah. Never one to be complimented. And, and butternut coffee commercials. Now, those were the days when we had live commercials. Oh, yeah. And those segments were sponsored. They weren't yep. just spots. You bought the whole segment. Right. And butternut coffee stayed with him his entire run. And those guys would screw the cup down. Oh, yeah. Or they'd spike his coffee. Or they'd superheat it. Yeah. Because he would get up and he'd say, you know, and he'd take a drink while it was scalding hot. And he'd have to. I remember one time he took a, they spiked his coffee with brandy or whatever. <laughs> yes. And I remember watching this one. And he said, you can only smell what I'm smelling right now. <laughs> but, you know, he... But all commercials were done live. And Most, yeah. And I remember one with Judy Marks, who became an icon in this city, just a wonderful, wonderful lady. And I can't remember what it was about. It has something to do with light bulbs. And I, all I can remember is Judy and light bulbs. I can't remember the rest of the commercials. When she was on WOKY-TV, and I think this may have been before she became their weather girl. She was the weather girl for several stations. She... Um, did a, a commercial, a live commercial, for a mattress manufacturer. And she had this waffle iron thing where she would make this, and then she would say, uh, this is so comfortable, and she would take a light bulb and put it on, between the mattress and the box spring. And then she would sit down on it and do the rest of the commercial, and at the end of the commercial, she would reach in, grab a light bulb, and say, see, that's how comfortable it is. The light bulb doesn't, hasn't been broken. Now, you said the critical thing, grab a light bulb. A light bulb, because they had others in there. <laughs> uh, she told me that she never came out with a bloody hand, so yes. she was in pretty good shape there. But uh, that was typical back-to-back -back live programming on most of the stations up through uh, the early 70s. How did you become interested in the horror movies and the horror hosts? I was... Um, 
I, I've often told this when I was on the old Reitman and Miller show, that Gene Miller, uh, Gino Salomon, the producer, and I were all the Jack de Blonde generation. Because I was born in 57, and so when I was three and a half years old, Jack de Blonde debuted on Cartoon Alley on Channel 6. Uh -huh. So as kids, we would watch that show amongst others, like Pop Cedar and Matt. Jack was a man of a million voices. Man of a, a staff announcer yep. who came to do this kid's show. And uh, then he also did a, uh, a horror host show starting in 1964 as a character named Dr. Cadaverino. That's the Dr. Cadaverino. And as a teenager, we would watch this. And he would do things like destroy his set with these battles. I mean, what more entertainment could you want for a 12-year-old? <laughs> and so I got interested in it and um, watched it as a teenager, and then it went off the air. And that kind of led me to uh, what I'm doing now because I was a professor at MSOE back in the mid-90s, and I discovered this magazine called Scary Monsters Magazine, and they had articles on the old horror hosts. And I said, well, maybe they're interested in one on Dr. Cadaverino. So I wrote the publisher, and he said yes, and of course I said, how much does it pay? And he said, pay. <laughs> I'll send you 10 issues. So I said, okay, fine. And I wrote to Channel 6 looking for some information. And they sent me some old clippings and a photo. And I said, wow, this is great. Let me write something up. And it just spiraled from there. And as I dug uh, through more and more clippings in the library and other sources, I discovered all these stations that I didn't know existed. And then a friend of mine named Bob Schwarz said, you know, you need to do something on the old UHF stations. And you mentioned WCAN-TV and WOKY-TV. I didn't know they existed. And then I befriended, uh, when I was living in Charlotte, I befriended the late Tom Snyder, right. who, of course, you knew. And Tom would call me talking about Lou Pollard at WCAN-TV and how he tried to get a job at every television station. And, and I said, okay, I need to do something. So uh, in 2000, I started a website with all this information. And it's become the online source. I mean, the Milwaukee Public Library almost immediately cataloged it. And, um, and uh, about three years ago, I said, you know, this needs to be a book. And had I known how much work it was <laughs> going to be, I, I would have done it anyway. But it has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. It's just that you wouldn't have been looking forward to it. Yeah. I, the, the people I have met, the people I've talked, about, talked to and interviewed, the things I've discovered. What are some of the things that surprised you? I think the biggest was just the battles. Uh, Milwaukee was in the UHF, VHF wars. Younger viewers are wondering what we're talking about because yep. they're just channels to them. Yes. But at the time television came out after World War II, there was only VHF and there were 13 channels. There really was a Channel 1 at one time. If you were lying awake at night wondering what happened to it, it disappeared in 1948. And uh, they needed to expand television to make room for more channels. And they went to so-called UHF, ultra high frequency. And when they did that, nobody wanted it. Right, because you couldn't, <coughs> you couldn't pick up the signal easily. You couldn't pick up the signal. The uh, tuners weren't very good. The transmitters didn't exist when they first started it. Um, it was the sort of uh, unwanted child. You only went to UHF if you had to. And what was really interesting was that in 1948, after the, after, let me back up for a second, after WTMJ went on the air, radio stations started applying for channels here in Milwaukee. Which would make sense. They're the only people who do anything about broadcasting. Right. So there were three applicants for Channel 6. The, the four channels assigned to Milwaukee were three. Which WTMJ was? TMJ was on Channel 3. Originally at Channel time. 3. Uh, channel 6, Channel 8, and Channel 10. That's all Milwaukee could get yeah. because of the proximity of Chicago. Because you have to be every other channel. Okay. In analog broadcasting. That changes. It's going to change on February 17th. So we had um, applicants for those stations. And after it all shook out in September of 1948, it looked like Channel 6 would be WEMP-TV. Channel 8 would be WFOX-TV, okay. the old Fox Club. Right, Bartell. And, and Channel 10 would be WISN-TV. Oh, really? That same <coughs> week, the FCC said, we're not going to assign any other stations unless you're 200 miles separate uh, your station, your proposed station from another one. And three weeks later, they froze all applications. Why did they do that? They had, uh, VHF was not sufficient to give every community in the United States a, a channel. In addition, color television had been invented 
but it had been invented by CBS using a rotating color wheel. It was a wheel with blue, green, and red filters on it, and it had to spin in front of the camera, and it had to spin synchronized with the camera in the receiver. Wow. And they wanted high-definition television with color, and the only place to put that was the UHF band, which at that time was untested. So the FCC um, also then quietly compressed the distance between stations. And of course, when you do that, interference can occur, even with a handful of stations that were on the air. So they said, we need to study this. It was only supposed to take six months. It wound up going until 1952. It was a great break for uh, WTMJ. It was. Because they were on the air broadcasting. It certainly shows that Walter Dam had the vision to put that station on the air because they had a monopoly on television in the in the state. They were the only station in the state. Wow. Uh, the other big thing that happened was that there was um, there were no educational television reservations, and by that I mean um, the FCC in FM, and before that something called Apex Radio, which is a whole other show, had reserved a certain number of frequencies for use by non-commercial educational uh, broadcasters that had not occurred in television. Well, uh, Harry Truman had called in Frida Hennock, who was a FCC commissioner, and said, hey, we need to do this. And hearings were held, and when the FCC lifted the freeze, they had reserved a number of stations for educational use. Now, the funny thing there was, in Milwaukee, remember we had four VHF channels. Right. We almost had three more stations that came that close. When the freeze was lifted, Milwaukee was assigned channels 4, that was for WTMJ-TV, who had a move, 10 and 12, those were VHF, and then UHF channels 19, 25, and 31. Channel 10 was reserved for educational use. Now, that was a war. That was a huge battle. That battle was fought at the local, state, and national levels. Didn't Senator Joe McCarthy get involved in that? Joe McCarthy had been, um, well, let me back up for a second. At the local level, the common, co Mayor Zeidler wanted to uh, have a, a municipally owned station. And the Common Council uh, originally approved that and then under pressure from the three radio stations who wanted those VHF channels, right. said no. A taxpayer's group, it's deja vu all over again, uh, fought it on the basis of uh, not wanting to use tax monies for it. Um, Hearst, of course, owned the Milwaukee Sentinel and WISN Radio at the time, and they wanted Channel 10. They had supported Joe McCarthy in his bid oh, of in 1952 for re-election. So McCarthy, given his one-man hearings, called in the chairman and a member of the FCC and held them in his office all day to keep them from acting on the Milwaukee Vocational School's application. And after all that got worked out, in a, another subplot. The problem with this story is there's so many plots and subplots. Yeah, we only have about a minute and a half, so. <clears throat> is they, uh, they got Channel 6 assigned to the area, and that killed off a couple, at least one UHF station, and then the state applied for Channel 10, and it took years for them to finally release that application so that this station could go on the air. Wow. So it went from Mayor Frank Seidler to, through Joe McCarthy, to Harry Truman, back and forth, to see who was going to end up with this very yeah. powerful station. They proposed it in 1951, and the station didn't go on the air until 1957. That's how much people wanted that VHF license and how much they did not want UHF. Um, Channel 25, WCAN-TV, most people have forgotten about. It's the, uh, the tower atop the hotel downtown. Really? Now the Hilton used to be the Schrader. Right. That was a, uh, actually an FM antenna that was supposed to be out in Hale's Corners. They never erected it there. And they put that up for Channel 25, CBS affiliate, second station on the air in Milwaukee, arguably the most successful UHF station in the country. Really? When Channel 6 was dropped in, it killed that I idea. The station went off the air. And it took something like uh, 25 years for another station to use that frequency. Wow. You couldn't give away a UHF frequency. Yeah. Just think if you had that now. Yeah. Where uh, do we go wrong, Dick? I, I, it's going to get even worse because... Um, with this digital transition, ultimately, the distribution method is going to change. It's not going to be over the air through these antennas. It's going to be via the internet. 
It's, it's incredible. It's a fascinating story. The history of Milwaukee television, the analog years. And uh, come on back and we'll get into more of it. It'll be great fun. Dick Olivieski, thanks for being with us. Thank you for being with us. I hope we will see you next time as we continue to remember. A pleasure. Have you heard about the transition to digital television? Maybe you still have a few questions like, do I need to buy a new television? Will satellite and cable TV be affected? What's the difference between DTV and HDTV? Well, PBS and this will... For WGN News is sponsored in part by Luna. This holiday season, save on new floors. Call Luna for your second room free and a low price guarantee. Day. Only one movie is being called a true life Mission Impossible. One of the year's best surprises. This is why you go to the movies. Tom Cruise, Valkyrie, Rated PG-13, tomorrow. Well, that's the news for us tonight, but stay tuned for Chicago's very own holiday special right after this newscast. Right now, we leave you tonight with a bit of Christmas Eve history. The astronauts of Apollo 8 reading Bible scriptures from space 40 years ago today. Merry Christmas, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Midnight Mass on WGN. Now your loved ones overseas and elsewhere can see it live. Only on WGNTV.com. Tonight at midnight. Sapelsa and happy holidays to you and yours. You know, there's nothing like Chicago during the holiday season. A time for celebration and reflection. And for the next half hour, we'd like to share some of Chicago's very own memories of our fair city. Yeah, the names and the look and, of course, even the toys have changed. But one thing has remained consistent throughout the years. There's no place like home. Sweet home Chicago. The holiday spirit was alive and well in 1939, despite worries of a coming world war in America. Franklin Roosevelt became the first president to appear on TV. While closer to home, Chicago re-elected Ed Kelly to a second term as mayor, and gangster Al Capone was released from Alcatraz after serving time for income tax evasion. Moviegoers flocked to see Dorothy and The Wizard of Oz that year, and detective comics captured the attention of kids everywhere with the introduction of a new character called Batman. Toy trains still held sway as the perfect Christmas gift, and Pinocchio dolls were at the top of many letters to Santa, but Chicago's lasting holiday legacy for 1939 came when a Montgomery Ward copywriter named Robert May penned a story of a misfit reindeer with a red nose. His creation would forever be remembered in books, songs, and TV shows as Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. For almost 60 years, that one-of-a-kind reindeer has been making a smile during the holidays. Rudolph's Chicago connection is still strong as ever, as our Micah Mater tells us. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. My father was a wonderful, creative 
incredible person um, who gave the world something that will never be taken away. All of the other reindeer. He never, ever would have imagined that, that it would be what it is today. Martha May and Betsy Decker are the youngest of Robert L. May's six children and call Chicago's northern suburbs home. My house is full of reindeer. I have every ornament, every little um, collectible. Here's the original oh my gosh. that I saved. We feel very fortunate. There are a lot of things we couldn't do, wouldn't have college educations for one, uh, if it weren't for, for Rudolph. Uh, the house we grew up in, my dad called it the house that Rudolph built. Back in the 30s, Robert L. May was an advertising copywriter for Montgomery Ward. His boss asked him to come up with a little something the store could give away at Christmas time. At that time, a red nose was associated with heavy drinking, not the kind of image Wards was looking for. So the boss rejected the little red-nosed reindeer. But Robert May had another idea and told this story on the radio in 1964. I then went to the artist and persuaded him to go with me to the Lincoln Park Zoo in Chicago to see if he couldn't work up some sketches of a little red-nosed reindeer that would not be uh, repulsive or suggesting of uh, too many drinks. The artist did a very good job, and uh, thanks to those sketches, I was able to convince the boss that it could be handled properly. With illustrations firmly in place, Robert L. May finished his story of the little reindeer who was picked on for being different. Ha ha, look at Rudolph. His nose is a sight. It's red as a beet, twice as big, twice as bright. You say the story's biographical. In many ways it is. The character had to overcome some negative aspects, obviously the red nose. My father, he grew up in a time where his parents skipped many grades, and so by the time he got to Dartmouth College, he was very small, incredibly, incredibly brilliant, but small. In the original book, Rudolph is sound asleep when Santa enters his room and recruits him on a foggy Christmas Eve. This note Rudolph wrote to his parents is in May's own handwriting. I need you, said Santa, to help me tonight, to lead all my dear on the rest of our flight. He put his heart and soul into a comic book that he was really getting nothing for. Millions of copies were given away. It turned into something huge that has changed Christmas has changed, I think, how kids feel about themselves. For 10 years, the book did well. All of the other reindeer. But it was the song, written a decade later by May's brother-in-law, Johnny Marks, that made Rudolph a superstar. Rudolph, with your nose so bright, won't you guide my sleigh tonight? It will be an honor, sir. By the 25th anniversary, Rudolph the Animagic Movie was made by Arthur Rankin, songwriter Johnny Marks's next door neighbor. Though Montgomery Ward could have kept the copyright, they rewarded their loyal and talented employee by signing over all Rudolph's rights to May and his family. Do you tell people? My dad did that. We were really really discouraged from doing that as kids and when people do find out about it most people don't believe it anyway call it a coincidence but what are the chances that while we were reminiscing three deer stopped by to say hi all part of the magic of growing up may the story of rudolph tells kids take your worst attribute turn it into something good be proud of what you've got and that that's a message that will go on forever you go down in his Nineteen fifty five marked a year of transition in Chicago. Mayor Richard J. Daley was elected for the first time to a post he would hold for twenty one record breaking years, while the city lost a giant with the passing of Tribune publisher Colonel Robert McCormick. The Windy City skyline had a new look with the opening of the Prudential Building, and in Displains there was another new building of note where Ray Kroc was starting a revolution with opening a McDonald's. Gas was twenty three cents a gallon, but you could dine in with the Swanson TV dinner for 98 cents and watch Fraser Thomas and Garfield Goose in their first year on WGN TV. While Marshall Fields readied for the holiday by moving their great tree into the walnut room, Santa was viewing all sorts of hot new presents, especially coonskin caps for boys and perhaps a new model train. Play-Doh 
was available for the first time, and Betsy Wetsy was a welcome sight under the tree for all Chicago girls. Bozo Circus is on the air. Their TV legends, Bozo the Clown, Garfield Goose, and Ray Rayner, together they define Chicago TV for a generation. Relive the memories this holiday season as WGN brings back your favorite television classics in a very special holiday presentation with Susie Snowflake, Frosty the Snowman, and Hard Rock Coco and Joe. Bozo, Gar, and Ray, tonight at 10 on WGN, Chicago CW. Hey, we gotta get... You doing some redecorating? Yeah, fantastic, right? <laughs> My cable DVR can only play back shows in the same room, so I just moved everything in here. Why don't you just get AT&T? You can record shows on one DVR and play them back on any TV in the house. Cookies are done. It's easy to beat Comcast with AT&T. Introducing Uverse TV Total Home DVR. Record shows on one DVR and play on any TV in your home. Get Uverse TV for $30 a month for one year. Home for the holidays. I believe I've missed each and every face. You are watching WGN Channel 9 Chicago. Let's turn on every love light in the place. It's time I found myself. Surrounded in your it just doesn't seem like Christmas here in Chicago until we start showing it on TV. Nineteen sixty eight was a stressful year in Chicago with the downtown riots at the Democratic Convention dominating the news. Two local legends went in different directions. Papa Bear George Hallis stepped down as the Bears head coach, while on WGN Radio, Wally Phillips ascended to the number one spot in the ratings. In a year when you could get a six-pack of Pepsi bottles for 59 cents or a gallon of gas for 34 cents, Hot Wheels was the hot new toy. Major Matt Mason was the president of choice for space-loving boys, but it was the three real astronauts that brought a healing to the end of the year as Jim Lovell, Frank Borman, and Bill Anders became the first men to circle the moon. They took time out to send the world a Christmas Eve message of peace. And from the crew of Apollo 8, God bless all of you on this good earth. It's hard to believe that 40 years ago, the crew of the Apollo 8 delivered its Christmas Eve message. And that historic voyage is part of the Chicago fabric, thanks to astronaut Jim Lovell, who took some time to sit down with our Steve Sanders to talk about that epic voyage. Uh, Apollo 8, Houston, uh, what does the old moon look like from 60 miles, over? I couldn't have thought of a better time to orbit the moon at the end of the year 1968 than to go to the moon for the first time. If there was ever a year America needed to patch up its self-image, it was 1968. I just want to do God's will. Dr. Martin Luther King had been assassinated in the spring. A few months later, Bobby Kennedy would also be cut down by an assassin's bullet. Americans had taken to the streets in violent protest against the war in Vietnam, and Chicago was shamed. We have left off. The nation got that much needed morale boost on the tip of a massive Saturn rocket. A thunderous blast that would launch a new era in space exploration and reassure a vulnerable nation. I don't think anybody at NASA or the crew at the time that we planned the flight, which was on the 21st of December, really thought that we would go into orbit around the moon on Christmas Eve. The real reason for the urgency of the December 21st launch, the Soviets were winning the race to the moon, a place no one had ever been. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. The danger was a given, but on Christmas Eve, the timing had raised the stakes. The possibility of a catastrophic accident on this night was unthinkable. You didn't personally think about the risk involved? Sure, there was risk, but the reward of going to the moon for the very first time 
uh, in the, as an explorer uh, was uh, well worth any kind of a risk that we had. The reward was spectacular. The never before seen far side of the moon, close up views of lunar mountains and giant craters, and then something even more dramatic and unexpected. The Earthrise. The picture of Earthrise that we see that has been so famous was taken with a telephoto lens. So in reality, the Earth with respect to the lunar horizon was smaller. I could put the whole Earth behind my thumb. And, you know, everything that you've ever known. A quarter million mile trip to the moon, yet the dark and gray destination pales in comparison to the place they'd come from. It was a very, very impressive site and one I think the all three of us will always remember as one of the most uh, significant aspects of going around the moon for the first time because that we then got really uh, an idea of where we were on earth. There was little time to enjoy this spectacular view. In addition to operating the lunar orbiter, Apollo 8 astronauts Jim Lovell, Frank Borman and Bill Anders had to prepare for what would become the most watched television broadcast in history. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. They took turns reading from the first 10 verses of Genesis from the Old Testament of the Bible on Christmas Eve. And the earth was without form and void. Sounds so simple and perfect now. But finding the right stuff back then had stumped NASA speechwriters and space journalists. As Captain Lovell tells it, the idea came from the wife of a newspaper reporter at 1 o'clock in the morning. It's easy. Most of the people will be listening to this crew uh, around uh, Christmas Eve, and they should be reading from the first 10 verses of Genesis, which is the basic... Uh, foundation of, of, of most of the world's religions. And God said, let there be light. Did you know that that was going to be the most watched television program in American history? Not really. Uh, when you're there, you don't know, uh, you know, how many people are interested in what you're doing and what you're not. And that was true also about 13. And this is the Emmy Award, by the way. The real Emmy Award that we received for the television on Apollo 8. And I thought the television was pretty poor myself. You did a pretty good job reading, though, I'll tell you yeah. that. So. <laughs> yeah. The Apollo 8 capsule and many of Captain Lovell's personal artifacts are on display at Chicago's world-renowned Museum of Science and Industry and the Adler Planetarium, including the Christmas Eve script. As soon as the broadcast was over with, we said, OK, tell us what we got to do next. Uh, we want to make sure that it, when we get around to the far side of the moon again, we got to light the engine you know, to get enough velocity to go home. Checklist number eight, read yeah, Genesis. That's right. <laughs> well, that's essentially what it was. We never saw the Earth quite the same way again, nor the moon on Christmas Eve. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. 60 years ago, 1948, was a banner year for post-war Chicago. The nation elected Harry Truman president in November, an event made even more memorable thanks to a Chicago Tribune slip-up on the early edition. WGN-TV went on the air for the first time, broadcasting from the Tribune Tower and baseball from Wrigley Field with Jack Brickhouse as part of a television boom that saw a million TV sets sold in America that year. At Northwestern, the Wildcat football team was preparing to play in their first ever Rose Bowl game. There were plenty of toys to be had for under a dollar, but for the bigger spender, an entire farm set could be yours for three dollars. Or maybe the time had come to drop 20 bucks on a fancy new record player. As TV programming ramped up, WGN celebrated Christmas Day by coming on the air early at 2 p.m. with a Christmas special. Starring Jimmy Stewart. Tonight at 1.30 on WGN.
It was a mystery not even the FBI could solve. The kidnappers are demanding one million in ransom. Until that darn cat got on their case. You make me look stupid. Now, he's turning the crime of the century into a major catastrophe. <gasps> Christina Ricci. I think there's something wrong with the engine. Doug E. Doug. He's slinking like a cat. Disney's That Darn Cat. Saturday at 1 on WGN Chicago CW. When you cover the Bears for the Chicago Tribune, you are the eyes and the ears of the fan. They know the sport as well as anybody, and I think they keep you on your toes. I've had some discussions, some pretty heated discussions. You know, there's somebody out there that either really agrees with you or really disagrees with you, and you know you're going to hear from both guys. I think they're very passionate and knowledgeable. They pay attention to detail. I feel I've got a unique perspective on the game, and I know what fans like, and I, I can give it to them. Our team has your team covered. Cool. Chicago Tribune Sports. In print, online, and via mobile. In 1960, Chicago was again at the center of the political world. Richard Nixon was nominated at the amphitheater before facing John Kennedy here in the first ever televised presidential debate. JFK won the election thanks to the second city, but the popular vote soon went to a new face whose show debuted on WGN that year, a clown by the name of Bozo. While the nation was introduced to Andy, Barney, and Opie on WGN, there were other fresh faces in 1960, including Clutch Cargo and a promising young third baseman named Ron Sano as the station began broadcasting baseball in color. A 12-inch snowfall on December the 21st made for an exceedingly white Christmas in Chicago, one that saw Mr. Machine marching under many trees, kids getting the chance to fly their very own jet, and everyone enjoying a brand new toy called Etch-A-Sketch. When it comes to Christmas in Chicago, one thing that jumps to mind is State Street, that great street. Chicago author Bob Letterman has written several books about the State Street holiday connection, and it's no surprise that his favorite memories revolve around the former Marshall Fields, now Macy's store. My favorite Chicago tradition is Fields and that area. I, I really think that that, to me, as far as Chicago goes, and now Macy's is taking over, uh, is keeping up with a lot of uh, the traditions of Fields and their own as well. But Marshall Fields is Chicago. It always will be Chicago to me because there is so many, many memories that I have as a child growing up, uh, going with my folks to the Walnut Room, going and eating under uh, the great tree in the Walnut Room, seeing the Uncle Mistletoe and Aunt Holly, which was at that time on the eighth floor. It was called Cozy Cloud Cottage. That's a little cottage that they lived in, and Santa would visit them. And I would see, remember waiting in lines for hours, literally hours. And as a youngster, you're about this tall, you know, and uh, you would see the uh, people's knees. You wouldn't see their heads, you know. You'd, you're, you're suffocated by seeing the people's legs and knees. But it was wonderful. Marshall Fields clock, they say, meet me under the clock. That was the favorite little saying. And Mr. Fields himself wanted a clock so badly to show people where the store was and to show people how to get there. And so that's how the whole thing started with the clock. The tree came about by the uh, little uh, people in the walnut room, and then it was called the tea room, that actually started thinking, let's put a little Christmas tree up. So they put a small tree. They had their own main homemade ornaments that they put on the tree, and that's where the tradition started. From then on in, it went faster and faster until later, through in the 30s and 40s, the tree was a fresh tree, and it was brought in from um, the forest in the Midwest, Midwest forest. And then these trees were dragged through the main aisle of the store at night. When they had the fresh tree, they had a fireman actually seated in the walnut room watching the tree so the tree wouldn't catch on fire. This was done until they, they thought in the 1960s that it was so dangerous that they better get an artificial tree. 1983 was a year of celebration in Chicago with the election of Harold Washington as the city's first African-American mayor and elevation of Archbishop Joseph Bernadine to Cardinal. Baseball's 50th annual All-Star Game returned to its Comiskey Park birthplace and the White Sox capped off a great year on the south side, winning the AL West by a stunning 20 games. Chicago-based Ameritech ushered in a new generation just before the holidays when it offered the nation's first cellular phone service. December got off to a 
thrilling start with the premiere of Michael Jackson's new video. My Little Pony was one new hit holiday toy, but shopping in 1983 will always be remembered for the craze surrounding the brand new Cabbage Patch dolls. On the big screen, Ralphie got his Red Ryder air rifle, while Chicago got a Christmas deep freeze with temperatures plunging to 23 below zero on Christmas Eve. How about a little private party to kick things off? If you wanted to play rough, all you had to do was ask. Damn that mother chucker. Hey! Oh, no, she didn't. This is like no high school I remember. You didn't go to West Bank, I puke. You didn't let it fit your way. Did you at least get a hooker in Reno? Hey! I can't eat this. A pizza touch my mashed potatoes. Are they separated now? Big leagues now, small belt. Ah! That was scary. I'm a dirty, filthy girl. Kind of looks like she got dressed on crack. Oh, oh my God. Oh, thank you very much. Now that's going to be stuck in my head all day. River Oaks Chrysler Jeep makes finding quality pre-owned vehicles easier than ever. Our entire inventory of pre-owned vehicles is available 24-7 without leaving home. At ROCP.com, you'll quickly find color photos and accurate descriptions, not to mention our low internet pricing. River Oaks Chrysler Jeep is leading the way again with internet car buying made easy. That's the Hennessy difference. Log on today or any day. ROCP.com. Customer satisfaction is just a click away. WGN-TV, Grants Appliances, Electronics, and more. And Comcast want to hook you up with a 40-inch digital TV from Sony Bravia so that you'll be ready for the switch to digital broadcasting when it happens this February. From now through February, we're giving away one 40-inch Sony digital TV a month. Just go to WGNTV.com and enter, and you'll be qualified to win. Make sure you're ready for the switch to DTV in February 2009. Brought to you by Grants Appliances, Electronics, and more. Comcast, Sony Bravia, and WGN. Chicago had a new look for the holidays in 1966. The city Christmas tree moved from Grant Park to its current location in Daly Plaza. And the city also announced plans for another newcomer that year, the famed Picasso statue. Though initial reports said the structure looked like a platypus. At the International Amphitheater, the Chicago Bulls were in the midst of their first season with Red Kerr as head coach. There were plenty of new fashions to choose from for holiday gifts, including men's sports shirts for under $4, while Dick Tracy Wait an invitation to spend Christmas on the moon. The Grinch and Max made their debut in 1966. Options for Under the Tree included the Easy Bake Oven for under $12, doodling with Busy Buzz Buzz and brand new things for kids such as a wild game of Twister and the chance to knock your block off with Rock'em Sock'em Robots. 1908 saw Chicago as the focus of the nation with William Howard Taft receiving the Republican presidential nomination at the Coliseum on his way to winning the election in November. The Cubs were winning, too, knocking off the Detroit Tigers for their second straight world championship while Charles Comiskey purchased land and began designing his new Comiskey Park. The city established the current street numbering system with State and Madison as the centerpiece, and Riverview Park installed a new 70-horse carousel at the staggering cost of $70,000. If you want to treat yourself to one of Henry Ford's brand new Model Ts by laying out $825, you had to spend two cents a gallon on gas to fill the 10-gallon tank. Then as now, merchants encourage holiday shoppers to go early to avoid the rush while kids had the chance to ogle the entire floor of toys and dreams at Marshall Fields. On December 20th, 1908, the Chicago Tribune published this article, how Christmas will be celebrated a hundred years from now. The story speculated how the holiday might change and a century later, the predictions are fun to review. 100 years from now, if you want to avoid the rush and do your Christmas shopping in your own apartments, the scientists probably will have provided you a combination of telescope and moving picture machine by which you can connect your room and the toy department to see the display by wire or perhaps wireless. At the same time, you get prices and leave your order with the clerk. That one was right on the mark. It's called a computer and online shopping. And if you're like me, you wouldn't get through Christmas without it. Predictions that 
Wheeled vehicles would be a thing of the past, and travel would be done almost exclusively by personal airship. Didn't exactly pan out. The automobile has been here to stay for all 100 years. The same with the thought that meals will be delivered mechanically by electronic dumbwaiter. We're still carrying on in the kitchen in our own house. Finally, the article proclaimed that Chicago would be the city of eternal light, where either by huge towers in the sky or electric airships a half mile over the ground, great electric suns would brighten the city day and night. The skies overhead may be free of blimps on a daily basis, but one look down Michigan Avenue at night tells you they got this one pretty right, too. The Tribune story ends with the hope that 100 years from now, peace on earth and good will prevail. And that holds true now as much as it ever did. For Chicago's very own Christmas, I'm Mark Sapelsa. Thank you for watching, and happy holidays. What is this? It's a speed booster. My internet's slow, so I thought this might help. Mm, all right. Whoa! 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 Why don't you just switch to AT&T? They're offering their fastest high-speed internet ever. You all right? No. <laughs> it's easy to beat Comcast with AT&T. AT&T now offers internet that is faster than Comcast. Switch today and get $100 cash back. <laughs>
Mildred, I have a feeling you better drink the tea without cream. <laughs> well, the last time I was here, they went out for cream, and two weeks later, I got a postcard from them from the south of France. <laughs> if it weren't for me, they'd never go anyplace. <laughs> Wednesday night at 6.30 Eastern, bank robbers take Mark hostage on The Rifleman. Then at 7, Elia is staked out as tiger bait on The Man from Uncle. Now stay with us for the best of Groucho, next on CBN.